Good evening everyone. Welcome to the RACV Great Vic webinar information session. Um, I'm Rebecca, I'm going to be the, um, I'm the event manager for the event and I'll be talking you through the presentation tonight. Um, but also on the line I've got Emmy Peterson. Hello everyone, my name is Emmy. I'm with the marketing team here at Bicycle Network. And it's great to see that we've got so many people on the call, which is really nice to see. So um, if you're not familiar with the GoToWebinar system from before, you've got a panel on your screen. So if you're on a computer, you'll see it on the right hand side, like a big grey box. And it has a question uh, and comment panel where you can um, type in any questions that you have during the webinar. So we really encourage you to ask anything that comes up for you and obviously we'll be sticking around at the end of the call as well if you have any additional questions. And um, yeah, back to you Rebecca. Thanks Emmy. Perhaps to get started and to make sure everyone can hear us loud and clear, if you want to, um, in the chat section on your panel on the um, right hand side, if you want to tell us where you're from and if you can hear us loud and clear, that would be great. Um, while we're waiting for that, tonight we're going to run through um, a little bit of information about Bicycle Network uh, and then of course go through a whole host of information about the Great Vic. So we'll talk about what it is, um, what's included in a ride entry uh, and I guess the whole experience so you've really got a good picture. Cool. We've got someone raising a hand there, that's cool. Um, Philip from Warrnambool. Welcome Philip. <laughs> You wouldn't believe it, I'm originally from Warrnambool myself. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, we might have a few more people just um, typing it in. If anyone is on a, um, a lap, uh, sorry, a um, an iPhone or a tablet of some sort, your question panel will be on the bottom of your screen where it says question or comment if you're struggling to find it. Excellent. Well, we might get started. Um, as I said, I'm Rebecca, I'm the event manager and also on the line tonight is Emmy. Um, in terms of our team for the Great Vic, there's about 60 of us from the office uh, who make up the team on event, but of course we're assisted by about 300 volunteers. Um, we do all work for an organisation called Bicycle Network, so some of you may know it formally um, as Bicycle Victoria. Uh, we've been Bicycle Network for a few years now and we are a self-funded health promotion charity. So our goal as an organisation is really, really simple and that's to make bike riding easy for everyone. Um, so we do this through our major events, but, uh, developing bike infrastructure, running different uh, behaviour change programs and the like. We are supported by over 45,000 members um, and we're growing rapidly uh, in our membership which is fantastic. Cool. Now on to the Great Vic. Just wanted to share as well, we've got another listener coming from Ballarat tonight. Oh, excellent. Welcome. Um, now on to the Great Vic. Now I'm not sure if anyone's been on the Great Vic before. If you um, got the opportunity to write in your question panel there, let us know. Um, but those of you who haven't, I guess this will be our 32nd year of the RACV Great Vic. Um, and it is a nine day fully supported camping and cycling holiday. Uh, we do have two other ride options though in addition to the nine days and that's a five day option and a three day option which I'll touch on a little bit later. Um, you are fully supported across the event so when you're out on the road our team are there to make sure you get um, from point A to point B as easy as possible and then when you get to the campsite we've got everything there that you need as well. The important thing to remember about the Great Vic though is that it is a ride and it's not a race. So I guess we encourage the community groups and also um, the riders to remember that they are tourists um, and treat the event like a holiday. So you can take your time when you're riding from one campsite to the next, stopping at the rest areas and the lunch stops in the towns along the way. Um, there's some beautiful communities this year so they're very excited to have the riders coming along. Um, and very much looking forward to seeing some of you there as well. Now with our riders this year, we are expecting about 3,500 riders um, and the majority of those will come from Victoria. Most are from metropolitan Melbourne areas but we do see um, quite a lot from regional areas and some from interstate as well. 
Now, in that 3,500 riders, there'll also be about 1,500 who come along with their school group. So most of those are year 9 and 10 students who use the event as sort of an outdoor ed type camp, um, but we also see some primary schools coming along now as well, and we've got a few new ones uh, with us this year. The other large group um, on the event is our volunteers. Now I did mention earlier we do have about 350 volunteers who come along for the full nine days um, and the team on your screen that you can see there is our volunteer support team. So we have a team of volunteers whose their job um, throughout the event is to look after the other volunteers and make sure they've got everything they need, help them with any issues, help put up their tents and all of that sort of thing. Um, there are about 20 different volunteer, volunteer teams uh, overall and they do everything from catering to marshalling, um, setting up the power and the water supplies and also putting out the signs that you see out on the road. Um, there's always volunteer opportunities on the Great Vic, so perhaps if you've got a partner or family or friends who are interested in the event but are not quite uh, comfortable doing the riding, then it is a good opportunity for them to come along as well and join you on the event, but just in a different capacity. Um, in addition to the volunteers, there's also a whole heap of contractors, so about another 150 contractors who help us get the job done each day. Uh, if there's any questions as I'm going along, please don't hesitate to pop them in the um, question box on your right-hand side there um, and we'll answer them as we are going through the information. <coughs> now, this year's event, we are heading up to rediscover the gold fields. Uh, we're starting in Ballarat, um, so we've got a local on the line tonight. I'm sure you're very familiar, but we're starting at Victoria Park in Ballarat, which is a really large green space, um, walking distance to Lake Wendere and also walking distance to the sort of the main street area of town there. It's a beautiful site and it's a great place to start. We'll start there on the Saturday and that is the arrival day. So uh, there is no riding on the day one and that gives you the opportunity to arrive to Ballarat, get yourself registered on site, set up your camp, settle in um, and also to meet your fellow riders. So dinner that night on site is generally a pretty noisy affair because you get people that haven't seen each other for 12 months catching up um, and also others making new friends when they're sitting down to eat uh, on the communal tables. On day two we are riding through to Avoca. Um, so we're going through the little towns there of Clunes and Talbot um, and we are riding out of Ballarat via um, or right around Lake Wanderee so it's a really beautiful start to the ride. Now for those of you who are red wine lovers, uh, you'll be in your element in Avoca because there's over 30 wineries based in the region there um, and they do do very lovely Shirazes. Um, on day three, we're going from Avoca to Denali. Now, Denali is sort of, um, it's a very small town. And I think we could refer to it as sort of the arts capital of the Gold Rush region. Um, they're very keen to have us and they've got a lot of community groups there that are um, thinking up some, some great ideas for how to entertain the riders. Um, that day is a fairly flat day of riding, um, but we do see a fairly significant change in scenery from um, iron bark forest, the olive groves and um, beautiful flat fields as well, it's lovely. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, on day four, from Evoke, uh, sorry, from Denali to Inglewood, now this is our challenge day, so it's a touch over 100 kilometres um, and it's a really, really beautiful day. We'll be travelling through um, I'm going to try and pronounce this correctly, Maligal, um, which is famous for the discovery of the world's largest gold nugget, which you might know as the Welcome Stranger. Um, it is a tough day, but once we get to Inglewood, um, they're preparing a huge party for the riders. Uh, they, the Lord and Shire, which Inglewood falls in, won um, the most loved town about four years ago when we were back up in the... Um, that sort of area was at Port and Wedderburn that year and they're planning to do even better this year. <coughs> On day five, so after the challenge day, we've got a shorter day which will take us into the rest stop at Bendigo. Um, so day five is from Inglewood to Bendigo and that's via Raywood. 
Um, it's pretty easy riding that day. Um, there is a closed road section for part of it. And then when you get to Bendigo, of course, on the Wednesday afternoon, uh, it's into the rest period for the event. So once you arrive on Wednesday, we have a full day off the bike on Thursday in Bendigo. And then we don't depart Bendigo again until Friday morning. <coughs> Now, if you're doing the five-day ride, uh, you'll ride from Ballarat to Bendigo. Um, so that's the first five days. You'll, you'll finish up with us um, on the rest day there. And if you're doing the three-day, you would join us in Bendigo on the rest day and would ride the final three days. Um, Bendigo is a pretty, um, I guess it's a, a fairly big regional centre. Um, lots of different things to do, so for whatever your interest, whether it's just going out to a nice cafe and having a nice breakfast um, or going to look at some antique shops and those sorts of things, they've got a huge variety. Um, there's also a lot of accommodation there for those who might look to stay off the campsite um, for that night or for those two nights just to get a break from the tents. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, uh, for the last three days, it's a loop. So we're on um, day seven, we're heading from Bendigo to Heathkit, um, which is a slightly longer day. So I think it's about I think 86 we've got up there at the moment. Um, and this route will take us through a tiny little town of Axdale. Um, very active town there, very um, much looking forward to having us. And there will also be an optional section this day on the O'Keefe Rail Trail. So if you want to have a look and see what that's like, perhaps thinking about going back later in the year or early next year to check it out, there will be a designated section that we can um, allow or we can encourage riders to have a look at and you can check that out. Again, Heathcote is a wine region, um, lovely reds there as well and their community there are looking at doing uh, closing off the street and having a sort of street party. Um, once you do get into town. From Heathcote on day eight, we are heading to Castle Main, or Castle Main. There's been a lot of debate in our office about um, what the correct pronunciation is. We'll stick with Castle Main for tonight. Um, now, there are some hills heading into Castle Main. This is probably the uh, one day in the ride where there are some sort of reasonable climbs. Um, but it's really great scenery as well and we do go across the Reddisdale Bridge, um, which is a, a beautiful historic bridge um, and really lovely site in the valley there. <coughs> On day nine, the final day after the last night in Castle Main, we're heading back to Bendigo. Um, it is a short day and that's what, as we know by this stage, most people are pretty tired and ready to go home. Um, but there are a few climbs in there just to keep the challenge um, there, so it's not too easy for you as we make our way back to Bendigo. So is there any questions at this stage about the route? <coughs> Whilst um, if there's any of those questions coming through, I'll talk about what's provided on the road. Um, but first of all, I wanted to go through how we determine the route. Uh, I did mention earlier that the Great Vic is a ride and not a race. Um, and something that comes with that, I guess, is that not all the roads or not all the roads are closed when we run this event. However, we do choose um, fairly quiet back roads um, and where possible avoiding major roads like highways and things like that. Um, we work very closely with Victoria Police, Vic Roads and the local councils. Um, in fact, last month we went out for three days and drove the route. Um, there's about 12 of us from those groups in the bus and we look at every intersection, every stretch of road um, and look at what we need to do there in terms of traffic treatment and signage and those sorts of things. So there's a number of small road closures this year. There's a lot of speed reductions in the areas that we're travelling and of course any right hand turns um, and major intersections are assisted with traffic control. We've actually got a question there, Beck, from uh, Bruce, who's asking a question about the, uh, the route, and he's wondering if it's suitable for average fitness riders. Absolutely. The Great Vic, I guess, is designed that there's enough there to challenge um, people that have been doing it for a little bit longer, people who have been riding a little bit longer, but also there's easy enough that there's people um, who haven't been riding for so long can do it. Um, as part of the preparation for Great Vic as well, we also provide uh, riders with uh, a 12-week training plan that comes courtesy of David Heatley from Cycling Inform. 
David's our resident cycling coach and that program, um, a colleague of mine, her mum actually used that program last year. She hadn't ridden a bike for about, oh, I think it was six years and she got stuck into that program um, and had no troubles riding the nine day event. So very good question, Bruce. I hope that answered. Um, but with, I guess with a little bit of training, anyone can um, get where they need to be for the event. Now on the route, as I mentioned, it is fully supported. So we do have the traffic control, the directional signage, um, so you'll know where you're going when there's a turn, whether it be left or right, um, when there's an extended period of sort of straight ahead. We have signage at those points so you know when you've got to make um, turns. There's also marshals out on the road at any hazards, any turns, any roundabouts, so those sorts of things. Um, and there are any, every 25 to 30 k's we have rest areas. So generally speaking there's about two rest areas each day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon and then in the middle of that there's a lunch site. At all the rest areas you'll find water, toilets, bike mechanics, first aid, all the basic things that we know that you need throughout the day um, and that also includes coffee because we know that's an essential service for uh, many of our riders. <clears throat> of course at the lunch site you'll find lunch and I'm going to touch on the meals a little bit later um, but you'll also, there's also photography on some days and Sometimes our sponsors are doing different activations at the rest areas as well. Um, we do have sag wagons on the route as well. So as you're riding along, if for some reason you're unable to continue, whether your bike breaks down or um, you injure yourself or anything like that, we've got sag wagons that will come along and pick you up and get you back to the next campsite. So that ensures that no one's left behind, even if they're not having the best of days. So Beck, we've actually got another question here from Richard in, um, and he's wondering about the V-Line trains. Did you want to touch on that question now or possibly later on with the transport options? Um, I will touch on the V-Line train when we get to the transport options a little bit later because um, there's a bit of an explanation around that one. No worries. I'll hold on to that question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now your ride entry. <clears throat> if you do decide to come along, and I'm not sure if some of you have already signed up or if you're still thinking about it. Uh, as I said earlier, we've got everything you need uh, for this event. So pre-event support, you will get monthly e-news updates. So every month we send out an email that has the latest event information. And that can include things from the final rider route, which we make public. You can um, jump onto Google Maps, see exactly what roads we're going down, all of that sort of thing. But we also put up there the menu so you know what food you are eating, the entertainment schedule so you know what bands are on at each night, um, and maps of the start and finish site so when you get there you know where you're going. As I mentioned earlier, we also have the um, Cycling Inform articles and a 12-week uh, program from David. And we do monthly Warby preparation rides. So the first Warby preparation ride kicks off in, I think it's about two weeks now. Those um, rides, there's a number of them run around Victoria. Most of them are based in Melbourne, but we generally have um, one up in Wodonga, one in Ballarat, and I think this year there's one in Taralga. Those rides are run by our volunteers, our Warbies, which I'll um, introduce you to a little bit um, in a second. But basically, as much as they're about training and getting the physical fitness, they're also about giving you an idea of what it's like to be riding in a group. They talk through group riding behaviour such as signalling, communication, um, <clears throat> how to go into the rest areas and all those sorts of things as well. The Warbies are also able to provide you with a little bit of information around um, basic bike skills, so uh, how to change a tube, um, how to tighten your brakes, all of those sorts of things. So they are fantastic rides and I would encourage you to get along to one if you um, have the time. They're generally on a Saturday or Sunday and run for a few hours each morning. <clears throat> so Becca, I've now just got another is. question. Sorry, we've got a question here from Philip. You guys are great, great question askers today. Um, he's wondering about the baggage limit and recommendations in terms of off-bike clothing to bring. Is that something you might want to touch on quickly now? Yeah, sure. So with your baggage limit, everyone's um, similar to the airlines, I guess. You're all able to bring 20 kilos of luggage and that can be in either one bag of up to 20 kilos 
or two bags of no more than 10 kilos. So what we find most people do is they pack one bag with all their camping gear, so that's their tent, their sleeping bag, their roll mat, all of those sorts of things, and then in the second bag they've got their personal items, so their clothing, their toiletry, their towel, all of those sorts of things. Um, there is full information on what you should bring on our website. It will also come out in our ride guide um, later in the year, which will be September. Um, but in terms of clothes for when you're off the bike, um, <clears throat> I would suggest prepare for all weather conditions. We do find with the Great Vic that one day it can be absolutely beautiful and sunny and the next day it can be pouring rain and that's the, sort of the nature of um, the time of year that we're in but also being in the regional areas. Um, a couple of pairs of pants, where perhaps it's one pair of jeans, a couple of pairs of shorts um, and a few t-shirts, a jumper and definitely bring a raincoat. Um, thongs are a great idea, you can then you can wear the thongs in the shower but also um, when you, if you're heading into town, those sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> and I guess that's probably the basics. Plenty of socks and jocks and all those sorts of things. Um, but the key to remember is we do have washing available, washing facilities I should say, available on the campsite. Um, it is hand washing, so it is a bit of manual work, but um, it just means that if you're coming for the nine days, you don't have to pack nine days worth of clothes. Now, on to our Warbies. <clears throat> um, our Warby team are a team of volunteers who have been um, with the event for well over 10 years now. Um, and Warby stands for We Are Right Behind You. You can't miss them. They're out on their road with the bright yellow jerseys that you can see on your screen. But they also have little flags on their bike with a W on them. What they do um, is the Warby team split up amongst the riding group. So some head out early, some head out in the middle of the day and there's also some towards the tail end of the rider group. And they're really there to support you and get you through the day. And they do that in all different forms. So it can be, um, can be bike support. So if you blow a tyre or your chain comes off, they'll pull over and give you a, give you a hand to sort that out. Um, it can be emotional support. I guess the best thing I've seen the Warbies doing um, is when we're up a tough hill or it's a long day. They just ride with people, talk to them, get them through those tough moments. Um, and it really is just about making sure that everyone gets from campsite to campsite um, as easily as possible, but they have a good experience while they're doing it. <coughs> Um, the other thing the Warbies can help with is first aid as well. So we do have separate medical teams out on the route, but all the Warbies are first aid qualified. So if someone just comes off with a bit of a cut or a graze or anything like that, um, they can certainly help you out. One of the best things about the Warbies though, um, and this is why I'd encourage you to go to the Warby preparation rides if you can, um, they're all really strong touring riders. So. Uh, John Pyle, who's a team leader, who's smack bang in the centre of your screen, um, he spends, he's retired now and spends close to half his year uh, touring around on his bike. So they know a lot about getting through the difficult days, what to do with your bike when it's not doing what, uh, what it should be doing and all those sorts of things. So hit them up for as many tips and tricks as you can. Now once we get through the riding each day, you'll arrive at our event campsites. <clears throat> we have an event campsite set up in every town. Normally they're sort of at recreation reserves or um, big park areas, but sometimes we do use private land. Um, our campsites open at 12 noon each day, so if you do um, rip through the riding and you get to campsite really early at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the morning, you will have to wait until midday until the campsite is open um, and that's just because it is a construction site. So all the um, trucks are coming in, the marquees are getting set up and all of those sorts of things. So we do ask if you are there early, you just head into town, grab a coffee or something to eat um, and wait until midday. <coughs> Now on the campsite you get three meals or two meals each day on the campsite and lunch is provided out on the road. Um, the meals on the campsite are breakfast and dinner. You'll also find toilets and showers. We have a medical centre and that's basically a mobile um, doctor's clinic. So it's staffed by doctors, nurses and first aid uh, officers. 
and they can help with anything from injuries or grazes, as I said earlier, but also we know with the nature of this event that people do, um, I guess like any other holiday, you can feel a bit crook, you can have a headache, all of those sorts of things, and they're able to help out with all those sorts of ailments. Um, <coughs> excuse me. On, at the entrance and the exit to each campsite, we have what we call our main street. So we call it Main Street because it's sort of like the Main Street in any other small town. It's where all the action is. So that's where you'll find our information booth, all our vendors, so the coffee carts, the cold drinks, um, the ice cream guys. It's also where you find a lot of the community groups who set up with sausage chisels and those sorts of things as well. Uh, ride information is set up there and our happy helpers who run the information booth are available until 8 p.m. each night to help you with any queries that you may have. Uh, and that's also where you pick up your SAG bike if you have jumped on the SAG bus that day. On the campsite, we also have two licensed bars. Um, that's Cafe de Canvas and the Spokes Bar. And they're, they're open from about 1.30 in the afternoon. Um, and you can have a dinner, you, know, you can sit down, listen to a band in the afternoon, have a beer, or it might be a wine with dinner and those sorts of things. Each night there's different entertainment, um, live music, talent quests, movies. Uh, last year we had a comedian. We do try and add a little bit of variety because we have so many different tastes um, and preferences within the campsite. Um, but every night you'll find something on and each night there's also two movies running on our big screen. Now you're probably wondering what all of this looks like. <coughs> Yes, our campsite's just coming up. I think that's just the delay on the screen there. There we go. All right, so this is what a campsite looks like. And I better start by saying that this campsite here in Merby North, which was back in 2012 for us when we were up in Gippsland, um, was an absolute perfect campsite. We couldn't have asked for a better site. And that's simply because when we're planning our Great Vic campsites, we look for two football ovals worth of space. But very rarely in regional areas do we actually find two football ovals side by side. Normally it's an oval with a bit of parkland and maybe a private paddock and things like that. Um, and this, this time in Merby North we hit the nail on the head. Um, and also in Denoli this year we've got two ovals side by side, which is very exciting for our campsite coordinator. Um, now I might start in the centre of the oval on the right hand side. Um, you'll see the white marquee with a blue and a red marquee attached to it uh, on the side there. That's our catering marquee. And you can think of that, I guess, as the dining and entertainment hall for the event. So that's where you go each morning for breakfast, each night for dinner. It's also where the bars are and where the live entertainment, so the bands, comedians and those uh, groups are every night. You'll find when you're eating dinner that there's... Um, You'll be sitting next to someone different each morning, each night. It's a really great community spirit um, and a really great communal atmosphere, I think, is probably a good way to describe it. Um, on each of the ovals, you can see there's clear walkways. So we do allow, um, we do mark out walkways where there's no camping, and that's for emergency access should we need it, but also to make it easy to walk between um, the thousands of tents that are on the site. Around the ovals, you can see there's a number of trucks scattered right around the ovals. Now, they're a mix of luggage trucks and toilet trucks. So we spread the toilet trucks around the site. So in the middle of the night, when you get up to go to the loo, you don't have to walk too far. So there should always be one uh, relatively close to where you're camping. And then the other trucks are the luggage trucks. So each morning when you wake up, you pack up your gear, load your bags onto one of our luggage trucks and each of those trucks are numbered one, two, six, I think they'll be this year. Once you load your gear on, take note of what number truck you put it on. So for example, if you put it on three, make sure you write number three on your hand or somewhere so you remember it. And then when you get to the next campsite, you find truck number three, grab your bags off it and set up your, your tent. Most people will tend to stick with the same luggage truck throughout the week to make it easy. Um, but some people do choose to move around the site and those sorts of things as well. We do have a few different areas of camping. So the general camping um, is for anyone and everybody. 
there's a schools camping area which on this uh, site on your screen was on the left hand oval and that we, we generally group the schools together so that um, they've got room, a little bit of room because they tend to kick around the balls, the footballs, um, soccer balls, those sorts of things. Uh, but also because they're riding in groups, they take up a little bit more space when they set up their tents as groups. And then we also have a quiet camping area at each site, uh, which is generally the furthest away from our catering marquee. And that's because in the morning the catering marquee or the trucks and all that out the back of the catering marquee start up pretty early. Um, so we put that uh, as far away as we can. Now I see we've got a question from Phil who has asked, are bikes secure at the campsite? <clears throat> a very good question. Um, we do encourage riders to lock up their bikes. Um, because the campsites are not 100% secure. Having said that, we do have security patrolling through the night and throughout the day as well. And we very rarely see any incidents on the site. So because they're in regional areas, um, they're generally away from uh, sort of the town areas and they're quite contained with trees and fences and those sorts of things. We don't have many issues at all and security do a good job of keeping an eye on it. What we find most people do is they tip their bike upside down so it's resting on the seat and the handlebars and then they tie one of their tent ropes to it. Um, so that makes it obviously difficult for anyone to pick it up or anything like that but also provides you with a great little washing line where you can hang your gear once you've uh, washed it in the afternoons. The um, with the camping, just down the bottom of your screen, just above the Great Victorian Bike Ride logo, you see there's little dots of brown tents. Um, they are our sleep easy tents. So if you don't have a tent, or you're not really fussed about putting your own one up and down each day for the nine or five days, um, you can pay a little bit extra for our sleep easy service where we will provide you with a tent and it will be put up and pulled down for you daily. Um, there's more information on that one on our website and all the prices as well. Uh, I touch on toilets but we also have showers on the site. So the showers are open every afternoon from 1 o'clock until 9pm. Uh, so once you get into site, set up your gear, most people then head over to have a shower. Um, we've got two types of showers which are the sort of individual pod type units but also there's for those who are looking for a speedier option there's um, some shower trucks as well which are sort of much quicker the way they operate. Um, I think that's it for the campsite. Was there any other questions about the site? <coughs> Um, whilst we're waiting for any questions to come through, I'll talk through uh, our meals that we provide on the Great Vic. So as I mentioned earlier, it's three meals a day. So that's breakfast, lunch and dinner. Um, breakfast is, I guess, a continental breakfast. So fruit, yogurt, um, cereals, bread, orange juice uh, and there's also porridge each morning. Uh, at breakfast as well, you can grab some snacks for out on the road. So there will generally be a muesli bar or a muffin or something like that that you can throw in your jersey pocket um, to have as you're riding throughout the morning. Uh, you can also grab with the bread that's there, there's also the little sort of sachets of Vegemite and peanut butter. And you're more than welcome to grab a couple of slices of bread to take a sandwich with you on the road if you do think you'll need something um, more to eat when you're out there. Lunch is normally a salad roll type um, roll or sandwich or a wrap and um, we do try and mix it up each day and there's also provided at lunch is fresh fruit, um, more snacks for the afternoon so it might be a sort of a snake or a um, killer python is what we, we call them, the, the old killer pythons. Um, muesli bars, muffins, all those sorts of things that again you can pop in your jersey and take with you. Dinner time, um, you'll normally find that there's what we call I guess the protein, so the main part of the meal which will be your meat or your chicken or there's always a vegetarian option. Um, and then it's served with a side, so that might be pasta, it might be rice, it might be potato and that's where you get your carbs from so that you're fueled up um, or refueling I guess for the next day. Dinner will also always have a salad 
and there's generally a bread roll or some um, pita bread or something like that to go with it, depending on the, what the item is that night. And also dessert. So sometimes that might be sort of like a cold chocolate pudding or fresh fruit and cream and those sorts of things. So we know that as riders that you really need to have a lot of fuel to get through the day's riding. So we make sure there's plenty of food. You can always go back for more if you're hungry. Um, and there's also throughout the day tea and coffee and all of that that's available for free. Now, our accommodation options on the site, I touched on um, the two general camping and quiet camping areas earlier. Also the sleep easy, which the information is available on our website. Um, and there's two types of sleep easy. There's sort of like a dome tent, which is your standard two-man dome, or there's the stand-up, what they call safari tent. So that's a sort of um, a square tent that has the pole in the middle that makes it, um, gives it a bit of height so you can stand up in it to make it easier to get changed and organise your gear and those sorts of things. The other option for camping on the event is our luxury accommodation package which is provided by All Trails. Um, again, if camping's not really your thing, you can pay a little bit more and all, all trails will arrange to have you transported from the site each day to accommodation providers nearby. So they might be small bed and breakfast, um, boutique hotels, those sorts of things. Again, that is an, um, a, a service that comes with an added cost. So if you are interested, have a look at our website and you'll find more information there. Now, getting to and from the event. <coughs> When we talk about Bendigo and Ballarat as the start and finish sites for the event, we find a lot of people automatically think of catching the V-Line trains. We wish it was that easy, um, but unfortunately V-Line have a policy where they uh, only allow a very small number of bikes on each train service. When I say small number, I mean about three or four. I think five is their maximum on some trains. So, um, they have released a statement in relation to the Great Vic and you can find that on our website, but basically they're encouraging riders to find other means of transport to and from the event because they don't want to see anybody getting left behind at the station because they can't get on with their bike. Um, now, knowing that that's an issue, we have a couple of options available to help with that. So we do have coach transport to and from the event. Now, the coach transport will leave from Melbourne or other regional centres. So we have transport from Geelong, Turalgan, Wodonga, Horsham, um, I think Wangaratta as well. All the details on our website. But basically, there'll be a departure point in those regional centres. You arrive there with your bags and your bike. Your bags obviously go under the bus. Your bike gets put on a truck like you can see in the picture there. And then you jump on the bus and we'll everything's transported through to the start site and then at the end of the event we do the reverse. So you jump on the box, uh, jumps on the buses at our sites and we take you back to where you wanted to um, or where you came from. The other option for getting to and from the event is the long term car parks. So in Ballarat and Bendigo we will have um, sites where you can park your car. There's a small fee attached to that and that goes to a community group who help us manage those sites. Basically in Ballarat if you park your car there you can get the shuttle bus to the actual site and then once you finish in Bendigo there'll be a bus that you can take back to the car park in Ballarat or vice versa if you park at Bendigo at the start of the ride um, there will be a bus there that can take you from Benigade to Ballarat to the start site. So your bike will be at the, your car will be at the finish site when you when you finish nine or five days later. All the information on the transport options um, and also the camping options are on our website, and that's under our, um, under the event tab. You'll see a page called Ride Extras, um, and they're all um, available to purchase through our shop but you do have until the 28th of October to finalise those um, those purchases. So even if you're still thinking about um, whether or not to come or you've made the decision to come along on the ride and you want to purchase your entry, you can do so and then worry about your transports later down the track. Now, 
any questions from tonight? I've thrown a lot of information out there with you. I feel like I've done a lot of talking, um, so I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, whilst we're waiting to see if any of those questions come through, keep in mind uh, our early bird period does end on Wednesday the 5th of August um, at 5pm. So if you are still thinking about coming along, we would encourage you to purchase your entry prior to then because you do save $100. Um, now in terms of the information provided tonight, after this session you'll all receive an email that has a recording um, of this webinar. Um, so if you want to rehear any of the information or you want to share it with any friends or family, uh, you're able to do that quite easily. Of course, um, Emmy and I will take any questions on the um, on the webinar here tonight. But if when you go away, you think of something else um, or forget what one of the answers was to your query, please don't hesitate to contact us, and you can do so by calling uh, Bicycle Network. We do have a one eight hundred number, or you can jump on our website and send us a message as well. Well, we've seemed to have triggered a few questions here on the line. So the first one from Ross is about, are there options for mobile phone charging at the campsite? <laughs> Fantastic question, Ross. I'm sorry I didn't touch on that earlier. Yes, there are. Um, we know that mobile phones and uh, charging them is an essential service for riders. Uh, so what we have set up in our Main Street area is a phone charging station. You purchase a token and the token costs $2 and gets you about a one hour charge. Um, the funds from that token that you purchase go towards a community group and that community group is the group that manage that charging station. So once you purchase your token, you take the token and your phone over to the booth. Uh, the community group will take both of those from you, charge up your phone, you come back an hour later um, with your, you get sort of like a tag that has your number on it and you pick up your phone. So it's a really great service, it works really well um, and we find that that's enough to keep people going throughout each day because people are of course using um, different apps on their phones when they're riding, whether it be for tracking how you're riding or listening to music and those sorts of things. So we do have that service available. And we've got a second question from Bruce who's wondering if there is a time limit on the daily rides. Uh, Bruce. In the morning, there's not a time limit as such each day. Uh, in the morning, you do have to have left the campsite by 9 a.m. Um, so the route opens at 6.30 a.m. So you can't leave before 6.30, but you have to be gone by 9 a.m. Once you're out on the road, uh, we know that because this is a holiday for our riders, um, it does take people longer because they are stopping in towns, checking out the scenery, all of those sorts of things. Um, so you can take as long as you like. We generally find that the slowest rider in the group is around about 9 to 10 kilometres an hour. Um, so we plan all our timing, our traffic management, all those sorts of things based on that figure. Um, we find that most riders though are into the site around 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, depending on the distance, um, and the route is normally closed by about 5.30 p.m which is means that's when the last rider is in by. Excellent. That seems to be all of the questions for now. We're getting a few thank yous coming through. Lovely. Looking forward to seeing you all on the event as well. Um, this will be my fourth Great Vic that I've been involved with. Um, each year they're incredibly unique, but I guess the thing that I love the most and that um, I see uh, is something that we don't really see anywhere else these days is a real uh, sense of community that develops amongst the riding group. Um, it's a wonderful experience. It's a beautiful area that we're heading to this year. Um, we're very excited and I do hope that we'll see you up there in November. Wonderful. All right, well, I think we're ready to wrap up for the evening. As Rebecca said, any um, questions at all, you can probably find most of the details on greatvic.com.au and don't hesitate to give us a call if there's anything else that you need to make your decision about joining us on the ride. Excellent. Well, thanks, thanks very much for coming along. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Bye.